Hi, this is Pascal Bernas with French Wine Explorers, and today we'd like to talk about Burgundy. One of the best ways to talk about Burgundy is through its food and wine. So I decided to invite my friend Adeline Bourra, who owns Terroir by Adeline in Beaune, France, which is in the heart of Burgundy. And we're going to talk about the top five secrets to making the best Boeuf Bourguignon. So let's patch her in and ask some questions. I can't Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, yeah. oh, good. And you? I'm good. I'm good. So this is my friend Adeline Bourra, who is from Terroir by Adeline in Beaune, which is in the heart of Burgundy. And we are going to talk about the top five secrets to making a Boeuf Bourguignon. Before we do, I wanted to just go over who we are, what we do, and how we do it. So briefly, French Wine Explorers offers wine tours in France to help wine lovers become connoisseurs. And one of the best ways to learn about French wine, especially wine from Burgundy, is to pair it with food. So we have Adeline, who owns Terroir by Adeline, and I'll let you go ahead and talk about what you do. Okay, hi. Uh, thanks, Pascal, for hosting me today and being with you. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Adeline Bora. So I'm running um, a food and wine experiences uh, place right in the center of Beaune called Terroir by Adeline. And I actually did a culinary school in Italy, and then we've been uh, living in, that, in Atlanta, Georgia for 12 years, where I was a cooking instructor and then a private chef for the French, uh, French suites and then Belgium consulate. I work as a private chef as well for Delta Airlines and NG. And then I uh, built and designed a company, a pop-up dinners company with a French, um, French sommelier. Now we are back in Beaune, right, like you said, in the center of Burgundy, and where I have this beautiful place where we are right now, I don't know if you see that. Uh, and then, so I'm doing cooking class from scratch, and then a cooking class with market tour as well, every Saturdays or, se or Wednesdays. And also I do cooking uh, and wine class with a food and wine pairing. So today we're gonna to talk about Boeuf Bourguignon. So let me just tell you my little story about Boeuf Bourguignon. Yes. I, um, of course, I love all French food, and my grandmother was an excellent cook, as, my, as is my mother, um, and she always made boeuf calot for us. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to make a boeuf bourguignon, so I bought the Julia Child book, and 30 steps later, my boeuf bourguignon was like a small disaster. <laughs> it was, you know, I didn't braise it long enough, I used the wrong cut of meat, I really just, I hadn't, I really wish I had someone to say, okay, before you start with like a Julia Child style recipe starts maybe you know smaller and with basic concepts so i thought it would be nice if we just go over those basic concepts and then at the end we'll link to your um your, your recipe that you do online so that people can see how you do it and how easy yeah. it is and then we'll also link to a, a a printout of a recipe so that you know they can take it away from them but i think it's it's almost daunting for americans a boeuf bourguignon because um it just seems like it's so many steps, but um, really it can be done very easily and it can be very enjoyable. And what better way to share wine with friends than through food? And um, actually on one of our tours, one of our Grand Cru producers makes us a Boeuf Bourguignon. And at the end, of course, everybody's inspired to do a Boeuf Bourguignon. And so I think this would be a great opportunity for people to see that it's not as daunting as you think. So why don't we go over like just uh, like the top five things that you want to keep in the back of your mind when trying to replicate a Boeuf Bourguignon recipe, whether it's yours, Julia Child's, somebody else's, what, do you, what, what could you help us with? So actually you're right. So I mean like Boeuf Bourguignon, it's original, it originates from Burgundy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Eastern part of, uh, of France. And then so it's actually a combination, a nice association of two emblematic product from there, so beef and wine. So actually, I, the, the, the cut of meat, like you said, it's really important. So this is my first tip. So really try to, to find like, of course, a slow cooking um, beef cut, like a stew, stewing, uh, stewing beef, but you can also get, uh, to make it more flavor, you can go for a fatty brisket or even oxtail. Oxtail is just amazing because it's kind of gelatin. And so you need some to get a moist, uh, a moist, a moist beef at the end. 
because I mean, basically this kind of um, cooking, uh, as I said, it's slow, slow cooking. So it's going to take mm -hmm. hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. So the more you're going to cook, the better it's going to be. So it's so got to have some fat, right? It's got to have a little yes. bit of fat. Fat equals flavor. Fat, right? yes. okay. For the flavor and then for the moist, moistness of the, of the meat. So brisket, um, oxtail, short ribs delicious oh, okay. because you have a nice uh, fat, fat flavor and then even the the bone the bone would be super uh, tasty oh. and then and then the beef chick we talk about that together the beef yeah. chick yeah. and yeah. this is what i did on the video i chose the beef chick but beef chick but it's not easy to find that in the us yes. so that's why i give the other options for the other yes. uh, kind of meat yeah. yes. but beef chick is super good because you have some gelatin and collagen into the into the i mean it's a combination of muscles collagen and gelatin so which is a perfect uh, combination to make the the best uh, the best beef for, for beef bovine yeah so, so this is the so every, yeah so for everybody in the united states beef cheek is what we're talking about and the reason we talk about it is first of all if you go on one of our tours and our grand cru producer uh, makes it for you she doesn't tell you until the end it's beef cheeks because it would probably gross some people out right so then you realize wow this is great and then um so um, you can get beef cheek cheeks from a, if you have a local butcher, like for example, I have a local butcher, I have to order it in advance and I have to order a lot of it in order for it to make it worth his while. Um, but uh, if you don't, if you can't find beef cheeks, I would definitely start with a cut of meat that you're very comfortable with, like a pot roast kind of meat, whatever you can find at the grocery store. And you have to look to make sure it has a little bit of fat. And I like the idea of the oxtail or the short ribs. I'm going to try okay, mine with short great. ribs. Yeah, I think that's Super a great, great idea. So, okay, so we've got the meat down. That's, that's the meat. So that's the second meat. Is like, yeah, so as I said, it's combination meat and wine. So yeah. the second tip is the wine. So you have to choose a good wine. Okay. I mean, like when I say good wine, a drinkable wine. Yes. It's because it's really important. Because, I mean, if it's a very acidic wine, mm -hmm. not flavoring, you're going to feel it in the sauce mm. at the end. Okay. So go for a drinkable wine, not super expensive. So regional level, like you can find, I mean, like, I don't know if we can, we can talk about different um, uh, supermarkets, but when I was in the U.S., I was using the one you can find uh, it, at Trader Joe's. Uh -huh. they, ha they are carrying a lot of different Pinot mm -hmm. and a very decent price. Like it was like around five, five six dollars. So like really the, the first, first price for Pinot Noir from mm -hmm. France, so from Burgundy. Okay. So that would be, that would be the idea. So that's, that's really important, the type of wine. And then because this is the wine, uh, even if you, at the end, you don't have any, you don't have the, the alcohol anymore, but it's still, I mean, it's still there, the, the flavor of the wine. So okay. Pinot Noir or as well, Gamay, because okay. Gamay, you use Gamay as well in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. uh, the Gamay is the one you have for the Beaujolais. Yes. Uh, and then also it's a, it's a nice fruity flavor that will be a nice combination with the beef. Okay, so for example, would you use a wine that is sort of just left over from the week before, or um, would you say, okay, no, it's better to have a fresh bottle? What would you? No, definitely use the one you have as a leftover. Ah, yes. okay, yeah. good, good. And you know, because I mean, I'm drinking a lot of vino, and then so what I do as well, I do a, a bottle for just combination of the different leftovers. So yeah. then I mean, I keep it, I keep in um. Uh, like uh, in a, let's say like in a, in a cabbage, um, in, in a, I would say a, yeah, in a cupboard, sorry, cabinet, cupboard. yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. like really with no, uh, no hair and then no uh, lights. Okay. So, and then you can, you can keep it for like months. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So you yeah, can do that. That's too. a great idea. Yeah. 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 And Christine, actually, when people ask her if she uses her Grand Cru wines to cook her Boeuf Bourguignon, she says yes, and she does the same exact thing as you and I, which is you're going to save the good stuff for this specific type of recipe. And that, in the old days, was why they used wine exactly. in the recipes, because it was, it was a product, it was a byproduct of uh, what they were doing and drinking and eating, and they didn't want to waste it. They didn't want to dump it down the drain. So this is a great way to reuse your wine that maybe you have left over from a party the week before. And I do believe that if you keep it in a dark place, like you said, with little air, um, 
that you can keep it for quite some time for cooking purposes, right? Yes. Yeah. Any okay. type of cooking you need. Yes. Uh, I mean, I know it's not the subject, but for example, I always add a, a big dash of Pinot Noir leftover uh, in my um, uh, beef uh, Bolognese sauce. Sorry. Uh, yes. And the, uh, with the spaghetti, right. that yeah. gives a nice kick to the Bolognese sauce as well. So, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Type of cooking, yeah. 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 Okay. So talk to me about the meat. Um, do you, what do you do to tenderize it? Do you tenderize it? What, how do you cut yeah, it? So that's, All that. Yes. That's the third, uh, third tip for making a, uh, a killer beef bourguignon. So the, to tenderize the meat. So it's really important. So that's, that's a step you don't have to skip, uh, skip out. So, uh, two options. So you can totally uh, marinate. I mean, my, my option, I mean, what I'm doing in the video is like you tenderize the meat with, uh, with, with wine. So you give like a wine bath and then you do that overnight. Okay. So you have to ke keep the, the, the beef with the veggie, I mean, covering that by wine into the fridge for overnight. Oh, now, okay. if you don't have time, Mm -hmm. If you don't have time to die, you say, oh my God, I want to, I want to be bourguignon tonight, but I mean, I haven't, I haven't done the marinade with the wine. My other option is that you tenderize with the um, sparkling water. Oh, the meat. okay. So you cover the meat with sparkling water for 15 to 15 minutes to an hour. And then you drain, you, you drain the meat and then you cover the meat by, with wine while you do the veggie, while you cut all the veggies and then the bacon and, and the onions, okay? So it will starting to be marinated in the wine, but not, of course, with the flavor for overnight, but it will, it will save you, I mean, it will save your recipe. And of course, it will be tenderized because the carbon dioxide started to tickle the muscles of the meat for 15 minutes or to one hour when you cover with the sparkling water. I like how you said, I like how you said that. It tickles the muscles. That's a great way to look at it. It's a great visual. Um, but that's a great trick because sometimes, you know, at the last minute you say, oh, I found this great yeah. cut of meat and I want to do it quickly and you don't have overnight. So I'm, I'd am i love that idea. I'm going to definitely try that the next time I do it. Um, and um, I, I didn't know that that's something that you could do to help tenderize the meat. So that's, that's great. Um, what's another tip that you have for us? So bouquet garni. Bouquet garni. So, so I actually took everything I mean like ready to show you very quick what I had to do how to do it. So it's it's super easy because I mean you take all the the, the herbs you have from the garden. Okay. So I have some leek spots. Uh, uh, I mean the green part of the leek. Okay. So keep this one. So each time you do a soup or you use I mean leeks for a tart or a quiche or whatever. What I'm doing for this one is fresh, but I mean I usually if you come to my class I mean you will see that I have my freezer full of this kind of part of the uh, green part of the leek in Ziploc bag. And then, so you take it from the, from the freezer, then you're gonna add one bay leaves, okay. some celery, celery stock, and then still in my garden, I still have rosemary and then parsley. Yeah. And then the idea is you're gonna tie it with a kitchen twine. And so this is a bouquet garni. So bouquet means in French, um, uh, bouquet garni means uh, it's a bunch of flour, usually a bouquet, mm -hmm. and then this is a bunch of herbs that will flavor your stew uh, or your soup. And then so it's really important because you don't, of course, you won't eat this. So you have to dump this at the end of the recipe. When when your beef bourguignon is done, you're gonna take you're gonna take this out, but it's gonna be there just to flavor your stew. So you can use that for any type of stew. Right. And for, and for people who are only cooking for two or for one, um, one of the things you can do here in the United States is you can actually look in the vegetable aisle. Sometimes they already have it they ready have it. for yes, you. Yes. So you don't have to buy like a whole leek and you know, all yeah. that, all those fresh, beautiful herbs. If you don't happen to have them in your garden or you forgot to freeze your yeah. leek tops. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's something. But I, I think that um, your point is, is that it's better to use fresh than dried. Uh, herbs. It, yeah, it's, be, it's better. But uh, as you said, I mean, like, I like the idea you can find some as well. I mean, in France as well, they do that. Oh, they but do. Um, yeah, they do as well. But it's not super common because uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, it, it's a long process. I mean, like the French, when they do that, they don't cook really during the week. They cook more really in the weekend. Yes. So as you said, I mean, some, some of the people don't have any garden or whatever. So they have to buy herbs so yeah they you can find it on the supermarket already made yeah yeah so. okay great uh anything else we need to just yes. keep in the back of our okay 
Yes, the last I sound excited, I so I'm excited. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because so my secret ingredient is this one. Okay. So this is okay for whatever the brand, but this is a creme de cassis. Oh. So it's a black currant liquor. So this is gonna give like a super nice flavor to your beef bourguignon. So I usually I mean at the end of the process, at the end of the cooking process. So just actually just right 15 minutes before the cook, the beef bourguignon is going to be done, okay? So this is going to give like a nice sweetness flavor. I mean, of course, a nice uh, fruit, uh, black fruit, dark fruit flavor to, the, to your beef bourguignon. And it will lower the acidity of the beef bourguignon if you, if you have some, some okay. wine. So it will be like super good. I mean, really, this is... A, a good tip. Yeah. So, Adeline, let, let's talk about what you're going to serve it with. What would you serve your Boeuf Bourguignon with? So, I actually prefer the three, the three bottles that I think would be good with this. And this is what I do. I mean, it depends on your budget. So, yeah. Uh, this is, yeah. So, I definitely uh, will start with the Bourgogne. So, uh, Bourgogne level, original level. So, this one is, um, is from a, a, a very great winemaker, I mean, based in in Volnay, but you can find any, uh, any. I mean, in, in the US, it's, really, it's pretty easy to find a Bourgogne label. So it would be between like 25 to 30 euros, uh, 30, 30 dollars, sorry. So um, yeah, I mean like this is a decent, I mean, you ask your wine boutique for that. So that will be yeah. my first choice. And then- That's the, the regional, one. right? That's the- That's, that's the regional, the that's the first label. Okay. That's the first level of the A, what we call the AOC. So that is going to be the wine yeah. that's produced in that region with grapes grown in yes. that region, but not necessarily specific to a village or a district or no. a vineyard. Okay, so that's Probably. your base level Burgundy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it means okay. like it could be a Bourgogne from the uh, Iran Sea, which is the, uh, the, um, the region of Chablis, or it could be completely from the Chalonnay, uh, Chalonnay, uh, Chalon region, the Côte Chalonnaise, or from Côte de Bonne or Côte de, Lu Côte de Nuit. I'm in Bonne, so that's why I usually uh, took one of the, the producer, I mean like around Bonne. So okay. then I mean my second level would be a village, so the second level of appellation, a, a Nuit Saint-Georges, because I love this, uh, this village. And then so I choose to show you one of other great um, winemaker. Uh, actually, here we are. So it's uh, from Benjamin Leroux. So this one, uh, this guy is a, actually, it's a childhood friend. So I was at school with him. Uh, ah, I mean, in the fun. same, I am. So that's, a, that's, and I'm super great, good friend with, a, with his wife, uh, which is a lovely person, I love her. And then, so this is a great producer. So Nuit Saint-Georges Village, you have tons of different Nuit Saint-Georges. Um, but yeah, so it, the, the price point would be between 30, probably 30 to 50 euros. Okay. Uh, so it would be more, so it's like more, a little bit more than, uh, than we said with the first one. So it would be around like $70 probably, something like that. Um, yeah, so that will be the new sandwich. But uh, you could totally go as well for a pomar if you, if you yeah. really want to, especially if you use the short ribs, um, yeah. because it's like more flavor and then more strength flavor for the beef, I will definitely switch and then go for a pomar uh, village okay. or even Pomar Premier Cru. And then the third uh, options, uh, a third option would be a Premier Cru. And then I think I was shooting for a Bonne Premier Cru because I'm in Bonne right now. Mm -hmm. And then just for your information, uh, you know, the Hospice de Bonne was canceled. Yes. Uh, the auction was canceled like three weeks ago. And yeah. it's back again this weekend. So on Sunday. Oh, yes. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. So I was thinking about that because I mean, like, Bonne Premier Cru is one of my favorites from the Hospice. So yeah, it's back again. I mean, so hopefully it's gonna be done yeah. by this weekend. Yeah. Okay. So okay. yeah, so it could be. Um, so I prefer like actually a Volnay as well. But we yeah, Volnay or Volnay Premier Cru or Bonne Premier Cru or would be a great option to go that. Uh, of course, I mean like if you really want to enjoy a Grand Cru, my preference would be for a Chazeau Grand Cru for this one. Okay. Okay. Um, or or even I mean like one of the Chambertin. You have many options in Chambertin, like La Tricière, yeah. Rochapelle, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it will, of course, do a very upscale yeah. Uh, wow. yeah. Yeah. So those are all great options. And I think, don't you think it's important that regardless of the option you choose, 
you want to make sure it's ready to drink. So for example, if you have a, yes. you know, if you have a stronger Puma or you have a Grand Cru, what are your thoughts? And I know this is very controversial, but I like to ask it anyway. What are your thoughts about decanting? Do you decant before for some of your wines? I that have a little bit more? You Okay, do. so this is what I do. Yeah, I really, I mean, I, I, to make the best experience of your wine, uh, I took, I usually decant each younger wine. Okay. Yeah. It's really mm -hmm. important so because I mean like people in, in their mind and it was like back to 20, 30 years ago, people would decant every, um, I mean, all the old wine, which is, I think it's a kind of a mistake yeah. because I mean, the, the old wine doesn't need to be aerated or, or they yeah. actually needs to be drink as much, I mean, as soon as you open the bottle right. instead of the young wine, uh, like 2017, mm -hmm. 2018, I mean, yeah. some people some winemaker have already released the 19. So definitely this one I will decan. So I usually decan uh, a village or a premier cru for 45 minutes to an hour yeah. uh, at room temperature. Uh, of course, I mean like, if it's like super hot in your <laughs> apartment, you can put on a balcony or whatever. I mean like to be, I mean the ideal stuff, the ideal temperature would be 70, between 65 and 7. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, like more than, it would be 65, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but then, I mean, like for a Chamb like for example, a Chambertin Grand Cru or a big Grand Cru, I will definitely decant for two hours. Okay? Yeah. Do you decant in the bottle or do you decant um, in a decanter or some kind of whatever? Oh, no, in a decanter. In decanter. Yeah. Now, I yeah, just, just, yeah, so... My thing is, is I'm a sloppy decanter. I had a, I had a splash on me and ever since then I don't decant in the bottle any, in the uh, decanter anymore. I just decant actually from the bottle, but just a little bit longer. Now, I know not everybody likes to do that because some people say you only the top part decants, but it works for me because I know which bottles I need to decant. And um, so that works for me. I just have to do it um, a little bit longer. I learned that from a, a, a big collector and with his older vintages, that's what he would do. He would just decant from the bottle because he said what, ha what happened with the older vintages is that sometimes you need to decant it just quickly just to release that off aroma sometimes yeah. that you get at the top of the cork. Um, and I tried it at home and I don't have to worry about splashing myself and being a messy decanter. So, um, for so and, and I'm lazy, so it's one less step for me. <laughs> Um, so that seems to work, but I think the important part is, is that you can't just open your Pinot and hope, you know, oh, it's going to be a perfect combination. You may be disappointed if you just, if you don't um, decant it at the amount of time that's needed, depending on the wine. Like an Ishizo is so big and bold, whether it's younger or yeah. an older one. So that one I would definitely see um uh the benefit of doing that and you know what we're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that everyone has the tips and tricks for the meal to be delicious and then we want the next level the next step is we want to if we're doing a wine pairing we want to make sure that we give you the the um the tips and the tricks so that when you pair your wine you're not like wow that is a really why would they do that why would they recommend that so i and i and i do think with the younger burgundies which nowadays that's pretty much all you can find um it's a great tip um so now let's talk about what do you have what would you recommend for side dishes uh with your boeuf bourguignon so since i mean as i told you like i did a culinary school in italy so yeah. my first choice is fresh tagliatelle so fresh, okay. fresh omelette pasta so okay. this is actually when I, when people coming for a cooking class here this is the side i'm doing with them because it's so fun making yeah. pasta making a home fresh pasta from scratch yeah. so that would be my first option my mom and my grandma they were used they were, they were usually doing a puree a potato puree mm. and then we got the recipe from the joel robuchon and so i have to tell you it's like same amount of potato and same amount of butter <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> very rich but i mean like, perfect yeah yes and then the other option would be a gratin dauphinois i would do uh, steamed potatoes i mean if you don't have time to do anything just do like a little simple steamed steamed potatoes yeah that would work perfect because we are going to have the sauce over the potatoes uh that you open i mean in half i mean yeah one of the things that people ask me all the time is, um, you know, how do you store it uh, once you've made it and you've enjoyed it? How long will it stay in the fridge and can you freeze it? And if so, how do you do that? 
So very easy. And then actually my recommendation is like when you do your beef bourguignon, it's better to do it a day before, a day in advance. Ah, okay. Because then when it's done, so you wait until it's like cooled down. Okay. And then you put it in the fridge overnight. So then I mean like the, the fact, I mean, the process to be in a fridge will enhance all the flavor of the meats. Okay, and of the dish. So first of all, so you do that, and then you can keep it in the fridge up to three days. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. After three days, I will freeze it, and so you can keep it in the freezer up to three months, and then so just to um to go back to to cook it to cook it back. So what I do, I usually tow the meat in the fridge. Uh, yeah. for 12 hours okay. on the bottom of the fridge for 12 hours and then you're going to reheat that very low uh, low medium heat uh, for half an hour until it's going to be back to to normal i mean back to to um to the the the, the real aspect of the beef bourguignon yeah. okay so, yeah definitely a day in advance okay you can keep it in the two days and then three months in the freezer and then after that, you reheat one hour. I mean, like between 30 minutes to one hour, but very, very, very low, low heat. Just to avoid to have something, I mean, to be like, um, it's going to scrap, I mean, the, um, how do you say that? To be stick into the bottom, to yeah. the bottom of the. Uh, so it doesn't uh, yeah. cause a crust or something like yes, that. Yes, yeah. 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 Sometimes what I do too, and I find that this, again, this is a lazy person's trick, but I'll take it out like an hour before I want to reheat it. Just so it gets closer to room temperature. That's a so good that, idea too. Yeah. 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 So when you so that way um, I don't have to worry about like overcooking it or making it yeah. you know going boiling and then so that that helps and um, of course if you have a slow cooker I guess that would be a great way to do it too because that's it's, that's a great way. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I love the idea of doing it the day before so that the flavors marinate together. I think that's one of the great things about a braised dish or any kind of stew is that it tends to be better um, the next day. So I think that's something that if people are looking at this, you know, you can make it for yourself for day one and then for your yeah. guests, you reheat it the next day and it would actually be better than, that's true. than for you. Um, okay, so let's just recap a couple, you know, a few things that we learned here. First of all, it's not difficult. It's only difficult if you want it to be. It can be very easy, right? <laughs> Um, let's just recap. What are the five things you want to consider? Um, so the cut of meat. Cut of meat. Marinate the wine. Marinate in the wine or in the sparkling water. I mean, like marinate in the wine and then sparkling water to 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 tickle the muscles. Yes. The wine. The wine yeah. itself. I yeah. mean, like Pinot Noir from Burgundy or Gamay. Okay. okay. Drinkable wine. Really yeah. Important. Bouquet garni. Yes, bouquet garni. A little, little bunch of herbs. Yeah. And then uh, the two secret, uh, secret tips. So the crème de cassis okay. and then the dark cocoa powder. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, you know, this has been great. And I'm sure that some of our people are going to try it at home. But in case they decide they want to go to Burgundy with us, this is something that perhaps you could um, teach them in your cooking school. Yeah, so you we're going to go ahead and post the recipe. Um, we'll have a link uh, on this, uh, this Zoom, and we'll have a link that um, shows you actually preparing. And um, I think that helps uh, people to really see that it's not that difficult. Um, and then uh, we, of course, encourage you to visit both of our um, websites. Um, and we will link that as well at the end of this Zoom call so that you can um, know where to find us. But um, this has been really great fun. I feel like I already, I've done it. I've, I'm a success. <laughs> I, you've been um, great help in giving us really um, some, some secrets on how to make a good boeuf bourguignon. I want to thank you for your time. I hope we can do this you again. Maybe we can do this again um, for another season um, based on the kind of responses we get. Yeah, um, that's a good idea. That's yeah. a very good idea. Okay, well, listen, it's been great fun. Enjoy um, the rest of your day, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.